Hi friends. Hello and welcome to the Nails and Hammers podcast. Our guest for today is Professor Himanshu Rai, who is the director of the Indian Institute of Management in Indore. We had to break down our conversation into two parts. And in the first part, we talked about how Professor Rai transitioned into academia after working for close to 9 years at Tata Steel and then finally deep dived into management lessons that we can learn from the Bhagavad Gita. It's time to listen and learn. Hello, Professor Rai. Welcome to the Nails and Hammers podcast. Thanks, Kushal. Pleasure to be here. So I want to start from the very beginning and talk about where all did you grow up and where did you go to school? So can you share a bit with us about that? I was born and grew up in a place called Kanpur in uh, UP in India. And that's where I did my entire schooling from uh, till class 12th. And after that, I went to Karnataka Regional Engineering College to do my engineering in electrical, post which I worked at Steel for about eight and a half years. Mm-hmm. And that is where I decided to shift into academics. And then mm-hmm. I went back to school at mm-hmm. IMM Adabad, completed my doctorate in negotiation, and then started teaching. And I've taught an XLRI Jamshedpur for a little over a year at IIM Lucknow for probably a little over 10 years. And then I was the Dean of the India campus of SDA Bakoni and a professor uh, at SDA Bakoni Milan. Now currently I'm the director of IIM Indore. You, you mentioned that you worked at Tata Steel for nine years. Uh, so what, what made you come back to academia? <laughs> so it's so a couple of things happen. Tata Steel is an amazing company to work with. So when it comes to most of the skills that I can talk about, apart from, of course, my industry experience, the entire credit goes to Tata Steel. And apart from making steel, which was uh, my uh, predominant job, basically taking care of electrical operations and three years of special assignment with corporate communications, I also did a lot of uh, creative things while I was working with Tata Steel. So I conducted over a hundred quizzes across the country. I conducted a few entries. I'm not a good singer. Thankfully, I made up for my lack of singing skills with my stage presence and with my sense of humor. So I would like to believe. Used and directed documentary films, uh, half a dozen plays, so on and so forth. While I was working with the corporate communications department uh, on a special assignment, so two things had happened. Mm-hmm. One is that I was increasingly realizing that I, I loved interacting more with human beings rather than with electrical machines, which is what predominantly my job was. That was one part. And therefore, I was feeling a little intellectually stifled. The second part was that I went to the Himalayas. I I go to the Himalayas uh, annually every year. But in that particular trip, I still remember this was 1998. And in that particular trip, I was uh, sitting on the top of a mountain after doing my, after completing my expedition. I had uh, done the summit, but I came across a passage which really made me introspect. It made me introspect about what is it that I really want to do with my life. And then just like um, I, I had my own Bodhi moment, a moment of enlightenment without the Bodhi tree out there, and I figured out the purpose of my life. And the moment I figured that out uh, and I got back to Jamshedpur, I immediately started thinking as to what would take me closer and faster what it is that I intend to do with my life. And the academic world seemed to be the ready reckoner. And I realized that it's through the academic world that I can achieve what is it that I have set for myself. And thus happened the shift to the academia. I know that the book was <laughs> Alice, in, Alice in the Wonderland. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You, you, you have that right. It was, it was yeah. Alice in Wonderland. And the particular passage uh, that I came across was when um, Alice has, uh, she, she's walking and she reaches crossroads. And these are actually crossroads of life, metaphorically. Mm-hmm. So she reaches crossroads and she doesn't know where to go. And fortunately for her, she's a, she sees a cat coming from the other direction. His name is Cheshire Cat. And Alice asks the Cheshire Cat, Cheshire Cat, where do I go from here? Which road do I take? And the cat says, that depends a good deal on where you wish to reach. Alice says, I don't much care where. The cat says, then it doesn't matter which road you take. That's what struck me smack in the face saying that, hey, I'm just walking, I'm working hard and maybe I will reach somewhere, but is that where I wanted to reach? Mm -hmm. And that's where the reflection and the introspection part started. When you joined Indore, 
you mentioned that you wanted to build leaders who are contextually relevant so mm-hmm. what do you mean by that i want i'm in door actually create responsible leaders so we have never see if you look at the history of leadership history of leadership has actually moved the shift has happened from the focus on the leader to leadership mm-hmm. therefore we said let's not focus on the individual but let's focus on the process if you look at how leadership is defined it is defined as a process by which a person influences others accomplish an object and directs an organization in such a way that makes it more cohesive and coherent mm-hmm. if you look at this definition of leadership so what i used to do was i thought this was a brilliant definition whenever i would conduct an executive program after telling my participants this definition i would ask them to name some leaders mm-hmm. much to my horror apart from naming the usual leaders which one would expect like a gandhi or a mandela or a, or a bill gates mm-hmm. uh, or, or one of the modern leaders they would also name the villains of the history and what i realized was that it was not their fault because even if you look at the villains of the history they actually come up with this definition mm-hmm. match this definition they also led their organization or their country in a way that made it more cohesive and coherent and i realized that there was some element which was missing in here that element was of responsible decision making mm-hmm. therefore when i say contextually relevant leaders i mean responsible leaders who are inclusive in their decision making and inclusive not only in terms of human beings also in terms of other living beings on this planet and the planet itself in terms of environment so speaking of leadership and being responsible you you seem to have done a lot of research into the intersection of leadership and vedic philosophy so how did that come about vedic philosophy is something that i've been interested in uh, right as a child the first language that i learned was sanskrit and that's mm-hmm. a language which i speak and love uh, mm-hmm. as much as i love english and hindi english and hindi came to me subsequently and that's mm-hmm. because my mother is a sanskrit scholar mm-hmm. and my mother's phd happens to be in sanskrit drama and a deal it was in ved oh. therefore i got it from uh, i got it from home so only books which we were surrounded by apart from the usual comics uh, mm-hmm. for, for us kids my younger brother and i were all the vedic was all the vedic literature and being a voracious reader i consumed all of it and what i saw was very fascinating once i moved into the field of management and academia i realized that there was a lot of treasure which was in there where we could draw lessons about leadership and of these my favorite book of course happens to be gita and not many of uh, people might know but yajurved has has its 40th chapter 17 mantras together these 17 mantras are called ishopanishad and gita is an expanded version of those 17 mantras and for when i dug deeper into those 17 mantras they in fact spoke about leadership and they and, and they spoke about ethical leadership define what is conscience define how leaders should develop their conscience they also define as to what are the characteristics of a good leader thus began a journey of researching to ethical leadership and deriving lessons from the vedas in fact by tech stock also mm-hmm. are ethical leadership lessons from oh. the vedas so gita talks a lot about the word dharma so what right. do you mean by the word dharma <laughs> so dharma first of all is very very different from the way we have defined religion dharma is not a panth it's it's not a sampraday it's not a math it means all of these that we call religion be it uh, monotheistic religion or the polytheistic religions all of these are essentially very very different from the way gita defines dharma gita defines dharma as dharyate yah sah dharma jo dharan kiya jaye wo dharma hai which means whatever comes to you naturally and ought to come to you naturally is your dharma for instance the dharma of sun to give heat and light and therefore gita says that the dharma of a human being humanity mm-hmm. thereafter it goes on to say as to what should humanity consist of what are those 10 attributes of dharma that a human being must follow particular gita speaks about swadharma swadharma is something that gita says something that you are very good at therefore 
you have a natural proclivity towards doing it well and by virtue of your being very good at it and by virtue of that thing giving you joy it also becomes your responsibility to ensure that you do it in the best of your capability so swadharma is something that at all of us have to find our swadharma mm-hmm. for example whatever i had my experience in in the himalayas on that particular day was my figuring out what my swadharma is likewise geeta says that all of us have to find out what our swadharma is so how can a young person today find their swadharma how to find out the swadharma once again geeta talks about three different yog mm-hmm. according to which by which by which you which you can actually figure out your swadharma it talks about the jnan yog it talks mm-hmm. about the karma yog and it talks about the bhakti yog but many people have tried to look at the meanings of these words literally so mm-hmm. what you have to look at is the metaphor behind all of these when we talk about jnan yog what geeta says is that you can figure out what your swadharma is by reading by reading a lot so read all the literature which is out there see what aspects of human life fascinate you what aspects of work fascinate you mm-hmm. this can be done by purely reading and reflecting on whatever it is that you're reading second is the karma yog which means have multiple experiences try out different jobs try out different categories of work and see as to what actually excites you what actually gives you joy what mm-hmm. actually you draw your passion from the third when it says bhakti yog says have a guru and mm-hmm. by guru it doesn't mean that somebody who's sitting on the some uh, even the himalayas but it could even mean a counselor to meet somebody who you have trust on meet somebody who you can actually be candid with and then try to take the suggestions or the feedback of that person and gita says you can try a combination of these you don't have to necessarily go through one of these ways you can use a multiple you can use multiple ways so you can mm-hmm. you can read about different stuff you can have different experiences at the same time you can have a guru and you can keep exchanging your thoughts and whatever is going on in your mind you can keep rebounding ideas of your guru and by using a multiple uh, a triaging a triangulation kind of a method you can figure out what your swadharma is the gita also talks a lot about following the process and doing your duties so does nishkam karma mean action without expectation or action with acceptance of what comes actually neither so if you mm-hmm. look at the chapter 2 shlok 47 of gita mm-hmm. it actually explains this particular concept it says karma ne vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachan ma karm phal hetur bhu ma te sangost akarmani the there some of the misconceptions which are around mm-hmm. this particular line because when people hear the first line they to misinterpret it karmane vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachan and people tend to think that what it means is karm ki ichha karo phal ki ichha na karo think only of the duty don't think of the consequences mm-hmm. not at all this is not what it means it says karmane vadikaraste you have a right to work you have mm-hmm. a right to your karma ma phaleshu kadachan do not have a right to the consequences or the fruits of your action this is completely different the saying is that if let's say I, i'm a teacher and i produce something let's say a great research work gita says your job is to produce the best possible research because that is what you're signed up for that does not mean that the research that you produce becomes yours it has to be for the world likewise your right is only towards giving your best mm-hmm. not towards whatever is coming out of it as a consequence mm-hmm. then the second part is extremely important where it says mark from fall hate to bhu don't do something for the sake of what you will get out of it but because it's a right thing to do so mm-hmm. that is the concept of nishkam karma don't form a particular action so as to get something out of it i should not go and do my best class in the classroom teach my best in the classroom so that i get accolades from the students i should do it because that's the right thing to do you know, i i should not take care of my elderly so that i receive something from them in return some gift or some kind of thing i should do it because it's a right thing to do so that is the first part the second line and very clearly many people who have misinterpreted uh, this particular shlok say that are haath mein kuch bhi nahi hai nothing is in your hands whatever has to happen will happen and that's where gita comes in 
and says, Ma karfal heturbhu, ma te sangos akarmani. Do not have a right in action. Mm -hmm. Cannot sit right and say, whatever has to happen, will happen, and therefore I am not going to do anything. So, do understand that here, Gita is also warning against an action, which means if you see something wrong happening around you, Gita says you can be quiet. It's your responsibility to protest. It's your responsibility to do something. If you see grief around you, it is your responsibility not just to empathize because anybody can empathize. But as mm -hmm. a human being, it's your responsibility not merely to empathize, but also do something to mitigate that grief. And that is what is meant by Mate Sangos Akarmani. That's a, that's a great summarization of the whole Nishkam Karma. So how can leaders be extremely driven and be detached at the same time? By understanding this, you see what leaders, or for that matter, any person, because every person, every human being has the potential to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Leader is simply a term which we use to denote a certain set of attributes or a particular process. Now, anybody can become a leader and all of us are leader within our own right. Leader has to, first of all, draw his or her passion from something mm -hmm. he or she is good at and believes in. So, for example, if you ask me, who are you? I'll say I'm a teacher or I'll mm -hmm. say I'm a mountaineer. Because mm -hmm. these are the two things that I draw my passion from, that I derive my passion from, and therefore they have become my identity for me. So likewise, leaders have to be passionate about what they are doing, and they can be so if they are trying to draw their identity from what they love. I've always maintained this. If you want happiness for a lifetime, do what you love. Don't get into something which you don't love simply because there was an expectation of either people around you or the world around you for you to do so. Therefore, if you're actually doing what you are loving, what you really love, you will draw your passion and therefore you will draw your sense of fulfillment from it. But at the same time, if you're passionate about something, you're not going to be worried about what goes and what happens because of that particular thing. Just love doing it. So if I if I love climbing mountains, I love climbing mountains because of nature and the beauty of the nature that I get to appreciate. Whether I'm actually able to do the peak or not really does not matter. What matters is the journey towards that peak, not really being at that peak. I think the moment you realize this, that the journey is far more important and the destination and therefore you start living in the here and now you will be able to as a leader draw from your passion follow your passion and yet not worry about what comes thereupon but then how do we include the component of accountability if a journey is all that matters so accountability to me should not depend on the numerical goals that you achieve at the end of the year it should depend on have you given in your best. For example, in this time of pandemic, if somebody were to expect that I would increase the revenues of my organization by such and such percentage, that wouldn't make sense at all. Mm -hmm. Because the situation is not conducive. And merely what I'm putting in can never be good enough. Mm -hmm. Have I given my best? Have I given my best and can that be documented? If that can be documented, and that is what a person's achievement should be measured by, by an external person. So long as I am concerned as an individual or as a leader, I know what I have done. Therefore, so long as I am happy with whatever it is that I have done and I'm satisfied that I've given it my best, I don't think I should worry about external approbation. I should not look at approbation from outside mm -hmm. so long as I'm happy inside. But I do get your point. It's, it it you get a little tricky only in terms of if we try to look at it from a very bigger perspective of, say, something like performance appraisal. Yeah. How do you appraise the performance of a person? Once again, please note that when Gita says, or when I talk about leadership and when I say that what matters and what you need to focus on is the action part of it and not the consequence part of it, we are not saying that the consequence is not going to happen. It is obviously very likely if I'm working very hard towards a particular goal, giving it my heart and soul, then the results will also come. Mm -hmm. Only thing we are saying is don't do this for the sake of the results. Yeah. Results will come. Every action will have a reaction. Every action will have a consequence. 
don't do it for the sake of that consequence. Do it because you're really enjoying this. That's that's reasonable. So why do some great leaders have moral failures? <laughs> I think it's it's purely because of what drives them something that is uh, I wouldn't even say which is it's it's material, but it is it is derived out of greed rather than service, rather than the feeling of service, rather than mm-hmm. sentiment that they were here thinking about a change in the universe around them or the universe at least. They had some kind of an influence. And that was a reason why I wasn't very thrilled with that particular definition of leadership. So, you know, just to recall, leadership is a process by which a person influences others to accomplish an objective and directs the organization in a way that makes it more cohesive and coherent. There is no moral compass so far as this definition is concerned. In fact, which is what had started worrying me in 2008 when in, um, when in India we had one of the scams and it happened in an organization and with a person who we all revered. It wasn't expected from that person. And normally when you think of scams, you think of a certain category of people. Yeah. You think of certain people who are always in the news for a kind of taking shortcuts, etc. Here was a very different kind of a person and yet the scam happened. And that's what drove me to think that what is it that we are missing out? Mm -hmm. I realized that there are two elements that we are missing out on in this particular definition of leadership. One was the element of justice. We weren't sure as to what is justice, what is fairness, what does being fair mean? The second part was about this responsible leadership as to what does being ethical mean. Mm -hmm. Thereafter, it has been my endeavor to ensure that I have brought ethics into the entire discourse of leadership. So coming back to your question as to why do some leaders you know, go or I, I think they get so consumed by their passion that they forget that merely passion is never going to make a leader. Even mm-hmm. the villains of the history have had passion. What differentiates a leader from a villain is compassion. Your passion has to be moderated with compassion. Not only do you need passion, not only do you need the drive, you also need to understand what is that guy for? Is it making people around you happier? Is it making the world around you a nicer place? And if it is not, then it is clearly not something that you should have set out to do. So can someone who has experienced a moral failure make a comeback? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm of that view that uh, just like uh, every saint had a past, Likewise, every sinner has a future. Look at look at the history. I mean, there there's so many people who have come back from a path which wasn't which wasn't the greatest of the paths that they could have taken. And therefore, there's always a comeback. The whole point is, do you have that realization? Have you become aware that whatever it is that you were doing was not right? So for example, what, what does education really mean? We are born as human beings. We are born like animals. All we have are our basic instincts. And it is through the process of education, through the process of learning, and through the process of culturization from our family, from our surroundings, and from the society, that we slowly start moving from being animal and following up only on our basic instincts to thinking about something which is higher. Therefore, it does not mean that suddenly we become cleansed of everything. The basic instincts still stay. When you become a human, you have the capability of getting over those basic instincts. And what differentiates us from the animals is that we have a free will. We have the freedom to make a choice. We have that heightened sense of thinking, heightened sense of discretion that we can make a choice despite our basic instincts mm-hmm. trying to tell us to move in a certain way. And that is where I think I will always give hope. Anybody who has done crime, no matter how heinous it is, mm-hmm. there is always a scope for the person to be reformed. Speaking of education, why is Vedic philosophy not taught in schools today? First of all, we have uh, inherited uh, education, both in terms of school and higher education from the British. Mm-hmm. And probably they didn't think uh, much of the Vedic philosophy, considering that they didn't have uh, many scholars. I think We've had most, if, if I have to look at Europe, we have had more uh, Vedic scholars in Germany 
uh, as compared to uh, as compared to Britain. Though there is an increased uh, interest in Vedic philosophy in several universities in Britain. So, so that is one. Two, we have always been a self-effacing kind of people, so far as our country is concerned. It is only very recently that we have started finding our own feet in the world, and, and we have started asserting ourselves without being uh, aggressive. Therefore, this, this entire need to bring the belief back into the systems which make sense, into those parts of our system, our culture and our civilization, that make sense and which have immense potential to actually change the landscape of education. Third, and I think that is the most important part, is that we don't have many Vedic scholars. So, you know, when I look around myself, when I was growing up reading all of these Vedic texts, I realized People who knew the Vedic texts, people who knew the language, uh, Sanskrit that is, were not the people who were into academia, they were usually priests or they were preachers. People who were into academia were not the ones who were interested in this. Mm -hmm. Now I see that there is a renewed interest in looking at the Vedic scriptures and looking at the Vedic texts and trying to derive lessons of uh, management, trying to derive lessons in other uh, streams of education also from them. But I can tell you one thing that we are still scratching the surface. There is so much that is in there that we can probably spend our entire lifetime and we would still be scratching the surface so far as the knowledge is concerned. However, mm -hmm. at the same time, a word of warning. Many a times we get so fascinated with our past that we start clinging to it no matter what. This entire tendency of somebody coming up with some new idea and us trying to point out, hey, this was already there in our text, it doesn't help because mm -hmm. nobody is going to believe it. What you need to do, what we need to do is to bring out something which is new. Nobody has brought out yet and say, hey, look, this is what I'm getting from my ancient wisdom. Let's not try and, and and make this claim that everything was already in there because if everything was in there, it simply points out, points out to a failure of not having brought it out earlier. For whatever reason, the reasons mm -hmm. one can keep giving any number of reasons, the fact remains that we did not bring it out so far. Mm -hmm. So let's not even go there because that reduces our credibility. Let's keep bringing out new things and saying, here is our contribution, and this contribution is coming from our ancient wisdom. So, so how can a young person like myself, who who just studied Sanskrit in tenth standard, start uh, reading Mahabharata or Gita today? First of all, you don't really need to understand Sanskrit to be able to read these texts because there are some translations which are available. Of course, I I concede that any translation would be a little removed from the truth because. Uh, very difficult for a person to do a literal translation. They do bring in their own perspectives and their perspectives may color those translations. So my suggestion would be that take it step by step. First thing that you need to do is to get into this habit of reading to mm -hmm. begin with. And closer you can be to the original text, the better it is. And therefore, I would still say that if you do not understand Sanskrit, possibly you can look at a Hindi text. Somebody who knew Sanskrit very, very well and has translated into a, a different language. So even mm -hmm. if it's a Tamil text or, or a Telugu text, somebody from somebody knew Sanskrit very, very well. Farther you keep going. So let's say if you read an English text, then it is very likely that the person has actually done a translation from one of the later languages like Hindi yeah. or, 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 some, or some other language. So then you would get twice removed. The meaning mm -hmm. of real text will be twice, twice removed from the truth because now there are two perspectives which are interspersed in whatever is coming out finally. If you can find a text which is closer in whatever language that you're comfortable with, you start there. And number two, you can always start learning Sanskrit. Yeah. And uh, summarizing the whole conversation around Gita and Mahabharat, why is it so difficult to implement lessons from Gita in our day-to-day -day lives or any other book for that matter? It's not difficult. Fundamentally, being good itself is difficult. People say being good is difficult. And that is because once again, you have to get over a lot of your very, very basic instincts. Those atavistic instincts which are inside you are very difficult to get over. It's, it's, it's just like it's very difficult to stay away from sweets if you happen to have a sweet tooth. 
a basic instinct will make you drool. Uh, that is where how much command do you have over your senses, how much control you have over your mind, that comes in handy. And that is something which is difficult to achieve. So it's not merely about following Gita or following any of the texts that you believe in. I mean, you can pick up a religious text as well. Mm -hmm. uh, does everyone who read Bible follow the Bible? Perhaps the answer is no. Does everyone who read the Quran follow the Quran? Perhaps the answer is no. Does everyone who read the Vedas follow the Vedas? Perhaps the answer is no. Mm -hmm. That is because for that to happen, there have to be three things. Mm -hmm. First of all, we have to be absolutely sure that whatever it is that we are reading, or whatever it is that we have belief in, is something which is going to do good to me. So, so there is a particular theory called the rooms expectancy theory. So sorry for mm -hmm. making it a professorial uh, yeah. kind of uh, an answer. The rooms expectancy theory talks about three elements. And it says it is a multiplicative combination of these three elements, which will make you do something. Mm -hmm. The first element is that of expectancy. And what it means is expectancy means if I work hard, I'm going to get good results. Mm -hmm. That's an expectancy. Second element is the element of instrumentality. If I get good results, I will be rewarded for them. It's called the element of instrumentality. Then you have the third element, which is called the element of valence, which is mm -hmm. the good results that I will get are those that are important to me. Which means mm -hmm. I value those. Uh, I value those rewards. The rewards mm -hmm. that I will get are, are rewards that I value. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example. Let's say exercising only if I believe. So what is the expectancy that if I exercise, I will have a fitter body. Mm -hmm. That is the expectancy part. What is the instrumentality part? If I have a fitter body, I will live longer. That is the instrumentality part. And the third part, the balance part is living long is really important to me. Yeah. What rooms expectancy theory says is that your motivation to do this will be a multiplicative factor of expectancy, instrumentality, and balance. So mm -hmm. if any of these are zero, the motivation to do this will be zero. So for mm -hmm. example, if you think no matter how much I exercise, my body never gets fit. It will yeah. not get fit. In that case, expectancy is zero, motivation becomes zero. Or you believe that if you exercise, your body will become fitter. It is not necessary that people with fit bodies live longer. Yeah. You point out at some uncle or aunt who used to exercise you know, three hours in a day and yet mm -hmm. young and you would say, well, it doesn't lead to that reward. Mm -hmm. In that case, your instrumentality is zero. And again, the motivation will be zero or the balance is zero, which means living long, not your idea of living. You say, mm -hmm. I don't want to really live long. I want to live a short, happy life. Yeah. Just want to keep doing whatever it is that I uh, love to do. And therefore, in that case, balance is zero. Mm -hmm. So all of these have to be positive for you to be motivated towards doing something doing anything. Mm -hmm. and the same rule applies what you have asked. Why is it difficult for people to actually do it? Because one of these three elements is zero. That's, that's another great answer, I would say. <laughs> Hi, friends. So this ends the first part of my conversation with Professor Rai. In the next episode, I'll be talking about negotiation theories and we'll get to know more about Professor Himanshu Rai as a person. Stay safe out there. <laughs>